Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Chris Lipper. I own the local franchise of the Alternative Board, and this is our June uh, Lunch and Learn. We have a Lunch and Learn every month, the second Friday of the month. With that said, July is in question, so we're not totally sure what's going to happen there yet. Um, normally, we would start with introductions. We're not going to have time today. There's way too many people to do that, but I do see a lot of current TAB members, past TAB members, friends of TAB, um, and future friends of TAB, and you're all welcome, and thank you for coming. Uh, so what we do once a month is we feature one of our members from the alternative board to give a talk, uh, an infomercial of sorts, on their various topics. And Pam is somewhat on, on the circuit right now, on the speaker circuit. I don't know if this is your fourth event this month or three or four, whatever you are. Yeah, so uh, it, I'm thrilled that uh, she's fit us into her schedule. And it's a topic that I find there's a, a lot of snake oil out there. And Pam will tell you what's involved with SEO to the point where you're, you'll understand, I don't want to do this, let's get Pam to do it kind of thing. <laughs> and uh, so with that, we're just going to start. And I'm going to give you Pam Ox. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out today. And uh, I hope that the information I'm about to give you is really helpful. I'm going to start by trying to gauge the room on where everyone's at in their website and SEO efforts. So how many people have a website for their business? Okay, all right, good majority. How many people have done something, anything, hired someone, studied, done, tried to do something with SEO, search engine optimization? Okay, all right, a little less. And uh, you'll understand the, why I'm asking this later, but how many people happen to have a WordPress website? Good, 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 good. Okay, cool. All right, so what we're gonna go over today is SEO 101, what this is, like he said, want to give you a working knowledge of it so that you can make good decisions. Um, for some people, it makes sense to handle it in-house and to educate their staff and themselves on it and handle it themselves. For other people, it makes sense to hire someone, but even if you hire someone, it's really good to know because unfortunately, like he said, there's a lot of snake oil salespeople out there in this industry. So it's really good to just wrap your head around the basics of how it works so that you can tell if someone really knows what they're talking about or not. So, and then I'll go over my threefold approach to SEO, which covers basically how it works and how I address it when I'm working on it all in one. I'm gonna talk about the importance of measurement and improvement, because this is a lot, uh, there's a lot to this. I promise you I'm gonna overwhelm you, guarantee it. <laughs> but I'll pull it back around and point out how to measure the results of your efforts when you're putting a lot of time and or money into this so that you can continuously improve and do more of what works and less of what doesn't work and not waste time or money. And I'll touch upon what's new in SEO because if there's anything close to a shortcut, there's no true shortcuts in SEO, but if there's anything close to it, it's some of the newer trends. So we'll touch upon that. Um, that says please ask questions along the way, but don't listen to that because <laughs> we actually, I have to make sure that I get through all the material and that Kathy can have her time and then we're going to have Q&A all at the end. So keep your questions in mind for the very end. And I'm not rushing out either, so if you want to talk after we close, that's fine. So about me, if you don't know me, I see a lot of faces that I don't yet know, which is awesome. Um, I'm a complete and total nerd. <laughs> I've been literally coding since six years old. Uh, my dad was a TV repair man. He had his own TV repair business, and uh, he would bring home the latest gadgets. We were a very techie family, and the latest gadgets at that time were the you know, Commodore 64 computers, beta VCRs, things like that. But I just latched right onto the computer stuff immediately and started uh, and sit there as a little kid and type three pages of code into that thing just to see a little yellow ball bounce around the screen. But I thought it was fantastic. I type in all these letters and numbers, and this happens. So I'm still fascinated by that. That's why I do what I do. So I've been creating websites since 1997. Naturally, when we got the internet in the house, I just started coding websites for fun in high school, because that's what everyone does for fun in high school, right? That's what I did for fun. Uh, so that not directly led into a career in e-commerce, but it did lead into a career in e-commerce, where I was e-commerce manager for two different companies. And that's where I really learned how to drive traffic to websites. I also, along the way, got my MBA in marketing, where they taught me absolutely nothing about digital marketing. but did drive home the importance of traditional marketing strategy, how to write a strategic and measurable marketing plan. And I really think that's what differentiates me now and how I approach SEO and everything that I do is the focus on strategy and measurement. So SEO 101, how this crazy stuff works. Search engines, okay, so 
they, search engines can't, at the exact moment that someone types something in, go check every website in the world at that moment. That would be too slow. So what they do instead is they take a copy of every website. They send a little a robot program along every couple of days to take a new copy of your website and insert it into their database, which is like a giant Excel spreadsheet. So it's data entry, basically. It takes this information over here, inserts it into a spreadsheet over here, and that is what gets searched against. So that's my website right there, all pretty in blue and graphics, but actually to the search engines, what it looks like is that. The information is just pulled out and categorized into a spreadsheet. So when a user, like Marge Simpson, types a query into a search engine, that's what gets searched against. And that leads into the first aspect of SEO, which is technical. There is a whole process involved in making sure that when that robot program comes along and extracts the information from your site to put in that giant Excel spreadsheet, that it doesn't get confused. It's similar to if you had, you know, we used to keep our names, addresses, and phone numbers of our contacts in a physical paper book. And if you took that book and handed it to someone and said, type this up in an Excel spreadsheet for me, if the handwriting was sloppy, the information would not come over correct or in full into the spreadsheet. So that's very similar to this with the website code. If the code is sloppy or not up to the latest SEO standards, then the robot program, when it comes along to extract that information and put it in its database, it's going to get confused. It's not going to come over fully or correctly and so on. So that's the first aspect that you want to check. And to check if your code is SEO friendly, there is a tool called WooRank. It's W-O-O-R-A-N-K.com. And if you're trying to feverishly make notes of all this, you can actually just download these slides with that link at the bottom there. So all these tips and tricks will be in there. So WooRank.com is pretty good check. It's not quite as in-depth as I would do if I was manually checking a website's code for SEO friendliness, but it will give you a good idea as to how far off your site is from where it needs to be. It will even color code, you know, this, this aspect of things, green is good, you're good, yellow might need a little tweaking, red, you have something, you have an error. So you go to WooRank.com and it's a paid SEO tool, but you can run one report for free. So when you run your report, just save it somehow, print it out, save it to PDF, whatever, just make sure you grab your information the first time you run it. And when you do with that, hand it to your webmaster and cry at the cost of getting it fixed. <laughs> but hopefully that's just a one-time thing and hopefully it's not so bad. And that's why I asked about WordPress. So WordPress is a very popular software. It used to just be for blogging. Now it basically powers whole websites and it powers about 20% of the websites in the world. And it is an open source software. It's actually, the software itself is free. No one owns it. So there's a community of hundreds of thousands of web developers all over the world constantly contributing to WordPress, making it better and better and better. So when these latest SEO standards come out and Google now says, oh, I want to, you know, we want to see you put a, a schema tag on your breadcrumb. They never said that before. Well, you know, the WordPress people are already on it and you can just install a free add-on or upgrade your software and you'll be taken care of. So the SEO, the WordPress software is very SEO friendly by default, the base of it. And then if you add some of their, excuse me, SEO plugins, the free add-ons, that gets you to like probably 95% of where you need to be. And there may be just minimal tweaking left to have manually done after you run this report. So big fan of WordPress. If you're trying to decide to, you know, make a website or redo your website, definitely take a look at WordPress. So that's the technical part of things. The next uh, part of the threefold strategy is the on page, which refers basically to what keywords you use, where and how you use them, and how you organize the information on your website. So first of all, keywords. Just want to start by dispelling a myth and referring back to those snake oil salespeople again. It's kind of just an FYI. If anyone says to you that we're going to optimize your meta keywords tag, show them the door. Red flag, straight from the horse's mouth, the horse being Matt Cutts at Google, I love referring to him as the horse. <laughs> they have been saying since about, I think, 2008 that they don't look at the meta keywords tag anymore. Met, back up a minute. Meta tags are code tags behind the scenes in your website that people can't see, but search engines can, 
and they serve the purpose of giving the search engines more information about the website than it could otherwise ascertain. So there are meta tags that are still used, meta title tag, meta description tag, meta robots tag. There's a whole bunch that are still used, but one in particular is not, not by Google anyway. Maybe some of the little small search engines you've never heard of may use it, but Google hasn't been looking at the meta keywords tag for a long time because it just got overused and abused right away. In the beginning of the whole website web thing, the only way you could tell a search engine what your site was about was to fill out this meta keywords tag but people just stuffed all sorts of phrases in there that had nothing to do with their actual website uh, topic. So it provided a really bad experience for the users as they were getting all these websites coming up <laughs> that had nothing to do with what they were searching for, so Google ditched the meta keywords tag a long time ago. So if you're doing it yourself and you're wondering if you should be paying attention to that or if you're hiring someone to help you and they're talking about that part, that is not something that matters anymore. What you do want to do with keywords is research. Google actually gives out data on how many times per month a term is searched a certain way and how competitive that is, meaning how many other websites are trying to rank for that term said that way. You can go into the AdWords Keyword Planner, it used to be called the Keyword Tool, now it's called the Keyword Planner, but it's a free tool, so you do have to create an AdWords account just to get in there. You don't have to pay, AdWords are those ads across the top and down the side of Google that you pay to be on the front page of Google. You don't have to buy them in order to get to this tool. You just have to have an AdWords account so that you can log into AdWords. Of course, as soon as you create an AdWords account and you log in, they're gonna say, buy ads now, put your credit card in. You don't have to just skip that whole part and go up to the tools menu and find the keyword planner. That will let you find out how popular a search term is and how competitive it is. And what you want to do with that information is use what I call the Goldilocks method. You want to pick phrases that are not too hot, not too cold, but just right. The ones that will have a healthy amount of search traffic but not be so competitive that you'll never have a chance of ranking for them. It's kind of an innate default tendency to want to pick the most popular way of saying it. Well, I want the most searches, so I want to say it the way that most people type it in. That's also the most competitive. So you won't have a hope or a prayer of ranking for those terms. Only the you know, most niche and wide brands and the Wikipedia type sites are going to rank for those terms. So you want ones that a lot of people type in, but it's not so competitive. On the other end of the spectrum, you don't want terms that are hardly ever searched because it'll be real easy to get to the top of page one for those, but no one types it in that way. So what good is it going to do you? That's also another red flag with uh, guaranteed number one results from SEO companies. That's basically what they do. They use these obscure terms and no one types it in that way, so there's no competition. So yeah, you're on the front page of Google in no time, and you will never get a single hit of website traffic from it. So. Goldilocks method, sweet spot in the middle. You want, that's how you want to pick your keywords. Next up in the on-page part of things is site structure, basically how you organize the information. And this is important because the robot that comes along to scan and insert it into Google or search engines database, it's just that, it's a robot. It can't think, it can't infer, it just looks at things very algorithmically. So if it sees one page on a company's website on the services page and it says, we do this and that and this and that and this and that, all of these different things all on one page and it goes to file that in that giant Excel spreadsheet, it's gonna not really know what to file it under. It's not clear. What we want to do is have one page for each thing. Basically one page for each key phrase that you want to get found for because if you use just one key phrase, one topic on a page consistently throughout that page, it's just perfectly clear when the robot comes along, oh well this word is here, 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 here on this page, the whole page is about that, I'm going to file it under that. I always use the um, analogy of example of a, a photographer. So a photographer might offer wedding photography and family portrait photography and corporate event photography. That's fine to have one services page that lists all that in index, but it's really important to allow the user and the search engine robot to click through into a page just about each one. So a page just about wedding photography, a different page just about family portrait photography, and so on, and then you pick your keywords very wisely when you create those pages, and it's perfectly clear when the search engine robot comes along, 
this page is about wedding photography, this one's about family portraits, and it files you in that Excel spreadsheet accordingly. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, so there's a little bit more to, so that's what keywords you use and how you use them. There's a little bit more to the on page, which is ongoing content strategy. Most people are familiar with the fact that you need fresh content on your site in order to appease the search engines. But there's a common misunderstanding about fresh content. Some people say, oh, well, I know the, the content has to be fresh or new, so I'm just going to take this page on my site and rewrite it every so often, and then it'll be fresh. That's not really accomplishing the goal. First of all, if the search engine robot already had you filed under one thing for that page and you changed the text, now it might get confused and not know what to file you under anymore. But the main reason it doesn't achieve the content, fresh content goal is it doesn't expand the size of the site. Google wants to see your site always growing bigger and bigger and bigger as far as number of pages. And so it looks like you are, it's, it's not just about new content or the site size growing, but the, the two together. You are the latest encyclopedia on your topic. You want to be you know, this hot news site for your topic. That's what they like. So you want to be adding new pages all the time. And the most common way to do that is through a blog. So you're adding articles. Because you can't keep talking about your same stuff on your website all the time and say it a different way, a different way. That would be a bad user experience. But you can certainly write articles and more articles and more articles on similar topics. And that actually achieves another goal, which is to have a lot of different keyword variation. So in your keyword research, maybe you've found three or five different ways to say one thing that are all in that good range. They're all in that healthy amount of search traffic range and not so much competition, but you can only use it one, you know, use one of those in the regular part of your website where you're describing your products and services and you don't really have a chance to use the others unless you're doing something like blogging. You can write an article and say it this way. So, you know, what, back to the photographer example, you know, maybe um, NJ wedding photographer was the best way to say it on the services page. And there was also, though, a good way to say it, which was uh, wedding photographer in New Jersey, spelled out. So, you know, maybe write an article of top 10 tips for choosing a wedding photographer in New Jersey. Then you got to say it that other way, but not confuse the search engine robot by saying it two different ways on the same page. Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> got some deer in the headlights looks and some nods, so I don't know if it's really making sense. If it's quick, I can take it. Do you need to tie that to that individual page? One phrase per page, yes. If you put up photos on a regular basis, the photos are a place to use the phrase on a page, the file name itself, and there's a thing called an image alt tag in the background. So if you are a photographer and you're just, your blog articles basically simply consist of photos that you're posting, naming the photos and tagging the photos behind the scenes with those phrases can achieve that goal. There really should be some text too. I mean, search engines love text. That's all they understand. So if you can do a paragraph description of the picture on the article, then that would achieve the goal too. So that's like same for video blogging. Photo blogging and video blogging, articles that consist just of a photo or just of a video. You can certainly tag things behind the scenes with keywords to help the search engines understand those, but if you can, add some text because that's, that's all the search engines understand. It's, a lot of people are like, really? I have to have the words on the page in order to get found for it? <laughs> yeah, that's all they understand. So, and the last goal of your fresh content strategy is to obtain links and social shares, which actually refers to the whole third bucket of off-page stuff. So I'll expand on that in a minute. But like I said, the way to achieve the goals of the fresh content is to blog and blog religiously. There's a direct correlation between the amount of blogging that you do and the amount of traffic that you get. But one quick note, the blog must be on your own website. It can't be on a blogspot.com or something like that because all of this search engine friendliness that you, you're doing by writing these articles and keywording them and getting links on them and social shares on them, all that mojo goes to the whatever.com that the content is on. So if your blog is on blogspot.com, the guess who's getting all the benefit of your hard work? Blogspot.com. Really needs to be on www.yourcompanyname.com slash blog or something like that. So like I was saying, there's a direct statistical correlation between the number of new pages added to a site on a regular basis, often in the form of articles, and tra traffic and rankings. 
So if you don't hardly ever blog at all, you might be down here. If you blog once a month, you might be somewhere over there, once a week, twice a week, daily. It's just as much as you can do, the more traffic you'll get. I know a guy who blogs daily, daily as in 365 days a year, birthdays, holidays, he never skips an article. It's pretty amazing. And he pays no attention to any of this stuff that I talked about so far with the keywords and the technical and this and that. No attention to it at all. Simply because of his volume, his traffic numbers are off the charts. Google has just filed him under the hottest news source on that topic that he writes about, and his traffic numbers are insane. That's not realistic for most businesses or people to do, to blog every single day. So it's just as much as you can hand handle, the more the better. Weekly is a, is a good target to, to reach for, for most small businesses. To make that effort easier, there's a strategy you can use that I refer to as editorial calendar. It's basically a fancy phrase for blogging <laughs> schedule, just a spreadsheet or even a note, handwritten notepad of you know, the date the article is going to come out, category that it's going to be under, the specific topic it's going to be about. And I like to choose in advance what key phrase exactly is going to be used based upon the keyword research and how I'm going to work that into the title because the title is one of the most impactful places to use a key phrase. If you sit down and plan that out in advance, you'll be amazed at how much easier it makes things. I showed someone this, this theory recently and you know, we were, I also showed her the keyword research thing. You'd be surprised too at how many ideas for articles you get in the keyword research process. So you're looking through that AdWords keyword tool and it's telling you related phrases to the ones that you're looking up. And you're like, oh, I could write an article about that or I can write an article about that. So if you just sit down and do a little planning in advance, before you know it, you could have four, six, eight, ten weeks of blog articles already planned out. So if you say to yourself, I'm going to blog on Friday afternoons and Friday afternoon comes along and it's been a long, exhausting week and you're like, all right, it's blogging time. What am I going to write about? You know, it, it, it really eliminates that whole thing and that whole stress and that writer's block. It's like, oh, well, you know, this week I just have to write about this and I have to use this word in it. And it makes it so much easier. I showed someone this recently and about an hour later she got back to me. She's like, I have a year, a year, a year worth of blogs articles planned out. She was so excited. And it was just because of a little advanced planning. So that can really help tremendously. But all of that information aside, if you write really great articles, everything else will follow. They'll get shared, they'll get linked to, they'll get searched, they'll, it'll just, you know, the search engines will realize that people are liking this content and it will rank. So, you know, I promised you I'd overwhelm you, I probably already have. <laughs> if you just set all that aside, all that keyword technical stuff, and keep in mind, if you write really good articles, articles that have genuinely useful information that your prospects would find useful, whether they do business with you or not, then everything else will fall into place. I'm going to take a breath and a drink of water. <laughs> so if you do all that, that's what will happen. This is a case study for a blog that I made. And the blog went from, obviously, zero visitors, because I just made it, to 7,000 visitors a month in 16 months. And it just kept going. And that's because I put all this into place, the technical, the on-page, and the off-page, which I'm about to talk about blogged weekly with you know, carefully, keyword, carefully chosen keywords and supported by all this off-page stuff. And it followed a very typical pattern. Absolutely nothing happened in the first three months, so that's very typical. And then Google was like, okay, you're cool, I think. We'll let you in to the club, I think, <laughs> on a trial basis. And it gave us like little bits along the way and kind of plateaued for a while. And then when, I guess about a year in, when it was clear that you know, we are a consistent good news source for this topic and people like our content, it just, they just, you know, it just snowballed from there. And it kept going and going and going. So don't get discouraged if nothing happens right away if you start working on this or having a vendor work on it for you. It is a long-term strategy for sure, but stick with it and you'll get there eventually. When you get there, it's really nice to get those leads coming in while you sleep, basically, for then free clicks too, not having to pay something like AdWords to get them. So that's the technical and the on-page aspects of the threefold approach to SEO strategy. The last but not least is off-page. So that refers to everything that happens not on your website that contributes to your reputation of your website in the search engine's eyes. 
The first of that is links, other websites linking to your site. And a common misconception here is, oh, well, I can, I can put a link on my site to this site and I can link out to this site. Those are outbound links when you're sending people away from your site to someone else's site. You want the reverse. You want other people's websites linking to your site, sending people your way. And the effect that that creates, this is how the search engines look at the internet. It's like a flight route map. Of course, I love that analogy. <laughs> and it makes it perfectly clear by all the available routes, all the available links to a site, what sites are good. So these two green blurbs in South America here, I know that those are popular airports. I have no idea what airports those are, but I know they're popular because of all the available routes to get to them. So that's one of the aspects of the link building, but that makes it sound like it's just about quantity and it's definitely not just about quantity anymore. This is another one of those things that people gamed the system and Google got sick of that and started looking elsewhere. It does still look at how many links you have, but what's more important is the reputation of the sites linking to you and the relevancy of them. What people did to game the system, they built link farms. They bought tens of thousands of their own web servers and built hundreds of thousands of their own websites on those, linked them all to each other, and sold off the links in chunks. That is not okay with Google. You will get kicked out of Google if you get caught doing that. So definitely don't focus on quantity focus more on quality and relevancy. One link from CNN.com to your site is worth 100,000 others. Or one link from the most topically relevant site there could be for you is worth a lot too. So in the photographer example, you know, the, the New Jersey Wedding Photographers Association Club or whatever, super relevant, you know, a link from there would be just as good as one from a really popular, rep, uh, reputable site. So can't drive home that point enough, not about quantity, about relevancy and reputation of the other sites that are linking to your site. Does that make sense? Yes, okay. Again though, all that aside, if you write great content on your site and you're helping people with this useful information, you're helping them through this decision research process about your product or service that they're going through anyway, if you're the one providing the useful information to them in that process, everything else will fall into place. A great article will get linked to naturally. People will be you know, discussing, discussing something about their wedding planning on a forum, like on the knot.com, and they're saying, oh, I saw this great article on top 10 tips on how to be the New Jersey wedding photographer. Here's the link. Boom, there's your links. So again, all this overwhelming stuff aside, great content leads to rankings and traffic. A little bit of a confusing part of this is Google's terms of service say it's not okay to pay for links. But it is okay to pay for a listing in a directory that has a real business purpose. So it gets confusing because it's like, all right, I'm paying to be listed on this website and that uh, comes along with a link. So I'm paying and I'm getting a link. Am I paying for a link? Like technically, yeah, but the, the delineating factor is if there's a real world business or human purpose to that transaction, other than I'm going to WeSellLinks.com and buying a 20 link package, if there's some other real world purpose to it, it's okay. It's, what's not okay is going to WeSellLinks.com and buying a 20 link package. Cham yes. If a chamber of commerce has a listing that includes a link to your website for free, that's great. If some similar kind of site says you have to pay 20 bucks to get listed and that, then you'll get your link, that sounds like, oh, well, I'm buying a link, that's not okay. That actually is okay because it has a real world business purpose. Like if the New Jersey Wedding Photographers Association Club website that I made up has a optional listing member directory listing for 20 bucks a year or whatever and includes a link, that's okay because it has a real world business purpose other than just getting that link. People would use it to help find a wedding photographer. So that's the delineating factor. It's really pretty clear when you think of it as, am I buying a, a link package or a link product or am I signing up for something else that has a real purpose? One of the other things that is okay, it's not okay to pay for links, but it is okay to pay for eyeballs on great content. So a certain percentage of people who see a great article will link to it. And it's okay to pay to get that article in front of more eyeballs so that that certain percentage of people that are going to link to it gets bigger. And one of the ways to do that is stumble upon paid discovery. 
stumbled upon is a funny thing. It's uh, something that hardly anyone ever hears of, or you never hear of people say, I use stumble upon all the time, right? But it drives an amazing amount of traffic to websites. And it's like Twitter, though. Like, the average shelf life of a tweet is four minutes before it gets buried in a million other tweets. StumbleUpon is kind of like that, too. You submit your article, you share it there, and it very quickly gets buried in a stream of new articles coming in. But they have this thing called paid discovery. And what that does is it basically pins your article to the top for a while. And that gets a lot of traffic to your website. You don't get buried. You get a lot of traffic very quickly. And then that certain percentage of people that's going to link to you, if your stuff is good, gets bigger. Case study where I did that, I wrote a really good article, made sure it was really, really good. I'm not going to pay money to promote an article that I just kind of threw together. So I wrote a really good article, and I paid 50 bucks to promote it on StumbleUpon. I very quickly got 500 visitors to that article. And 30 days later, I had 120 more links from 19 different websites than I had had before. That's like unheard of to do, to get 100 links in 30 days and have it be okay with Google, but that's okay because I didn't pay for the links. I just paid for the eyeballs of more people seeing my article and that natural percentage of people that is going to link to great content just got bigger because of it. So that is okay and is a great link building strategy. Promoting posts on uh, Facebook can be similar. If, the, if it's an article that lives on your website and you share it on Facebook and you pay to boost the post on Facebook, this, that same thing, you're just getting more eyeballs on good content that lives on your website and naturally some of those people will link to it. So the link building thing can be thought of more in terms of promoting your great content as opposed to, well, I need to get X amount of links from here, 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 and here. The link building system though, because it got gamed and because Google spends all day every day now fighting those link farms and trying to kick people out for doing that link building practice, those link building practices that break their rules, they're looking elsewhere for signals that content is good. And primarily for that, they're looking to social media. Social media is a, a literal thumbs up from a real human being that this is good stuff. So if someone shares an article on Facebook, someone clicks like on it, that's a social signal. And the more social signals you get, the higher your content will rank. Seven of the top eight ranking factors. So out of 250 plus things you could do to get your website to rank higher in Google, seven of the top eight last year were social signals. And the eighth one was links. So you know, just because your site's a, a match for a keyword, it's great that you've gone and organized your content and picked the right keywords and everything, and now your site is a match, but so are a lot of other websites. Maybe hundreds of thousands of other sites are also a match for that keyword. So how do they determine who gets on the first page and the first position of the first page and so on? That's where these off-page factors really matter. That's why these are the top eight. And the number one, actually by far, by a large margin, was Google+. Google+, Plus, it's kind of a joke as a social <laughs> network, but it's Google. People are like, really, I have to use Google+. Plus? It's Google, <laughs> and they love themselves, and they reward you, <laughs> right? <laughs> they reward you for using them. So the number of plus ones that a piece of content got, plus one is the equivalent on Google+, Plus of a, of a thumbs up, of a like on Facebook, the number of plus ones a piece of content got was by far the strongest influencer in how high that content ranked last year. So social, 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 building a, a strong social media presence simply so that when you share your good content to it, you get those likes and those plus ones and those LinkedIn shares and those tweets and those pins on Pinterest. That's how social media ties into an SEO strategy. And the last part of the off-page chapter is citations. I'm losing my microphone. <laughs> citations is basically a fancy word for online phone book listings. And this matters for businesses that want to get ranked geographically in a certain geographical region around a city. The way that this works is the more times that your website's name, address, and phone number, technically it's called a, I can't get this thing back on, technically it's called a NAP citation. So it has nothing to do with the link to your website. It has more to do with, I think I got it, more to do with the fact that your business's name, address, and phone number is listed in like, if it's listed in like hundreds of these online phone book sites across the net, like superpages.com, yellowpages.com, yellowbook.com, whitepages.com, there's hundreds of them, but if you're listed consistently in all of them, it's a signal to the search engine that, well, obviously this is a reputable business in that location. They're listed everywhere. So if it's important for you to get found in a certain region, 
then paying attention to citations is part of your off-page strategy. And what you can do to check your current status in that regard is this tool called Moz Local. You can go there and check and see how many of those sites that you're supposed to be in that, that you are in. I'm still struggling with this thing here. Okay, is that good? Can you still here? Okay, all right. Um, so if it's important to get found in a certain geographical region, definitely pay attention to this. This is pretty important for that. So that's the threefold strategy, technical, on page, off page. So now you've got all this overwhelming amount of stuff to pay attention to. But once you start spending time on this, if you measure consistently the results of your efforts and do more of what works and less of what's not working, then it will lead to better performance and lack of wasted time and money. I'm not gonna go through this specifically. You can just download the slides if you wanna make a note of these, but there's Google Analytics is a free website traffic measuring tool, and it's a beautiful thing, but it, there, it's almost too beautiful. There's too much information in there. You can go in there and spend six hours in there and have no idea what you just looked at. So in order to make good, useful decisions based upon the information in there, I recommend paying attention to these three things. And you'll see once you get in there and you start looking, actually that's the first one is now in Webmaster Tools. The keyword data for what keywords people use to get to your site is no longer really available in analytics, but it is in Webmaster Tools, which is another free Google tool. So just sign up for that one. And that's actually the only place that Google will communicate with you directly about your website. So if your website gets hacked and it gets kicked out of Google for having malware on it, the only place they're gonna tell you about that, or if they ping you for buying links and they kick you out because of that or they demote you because of that, the only place they're gonna tell you is in Webmaster Tools. So it's a good thing to sign up for that anyway. And then in there you can see your keywords and you'll get ideas for how to you know, write more articles. You're already getting, you know, one or, I call them onesies, twosies, you're already getting one or two hits on those keywords. You might as well put more content on your website about it and capitalize upon that. So check out those three reports when you download the slides and focus on measuring the results of your efforts so you don't waste time or money. And the last thing I'm gonna to touch upon is the latest trends. Like I said, if there's anything close to a shortcut, it's these. And two of the major ones now are authorship and local. And guess what they both have to do with? The redheaded stepchild of the social media in the world, <laughs> Google+. Plus. Authorship and local are both Google Plus concepts. Authorship is kind of a formal filing between a Google Plus profile, a person's Google Plus profile, and a website saying that this person over here is the author of this content over here. And what that does is it's another reputation signal. Because if that author is popular, if they're connected to a lot of people on Google Plus, well, that's a ranking factor now. I went from zero out of 484 million results for this term to number two when I linked up my authorship. Because I already had about a thousand connections on Google Plus at the time, it saw, as soon as it could see who the author of the content was and that it was popular, all of a sudden I jumped from zero out of 484 million to number two. Just real quick, where the hell is Google Plus? <laughs> <laughs> the question. I'm just, I'm just sitting here, like, where is it? Is the question it, was, it where the hell is Google Plus? <laughs> and the, the answer is plus.google.com. Instead of typing www.google.com, it's plus.google.com. P-L-U-S.google.com. <laughs> that right there. That's the authorship page, but if you just go to the main part, that's how you get to Google Plus. The second trend. <laughs> lately is local. I don't know if anyone gets that uh, movie reference, but a huge amount of real estate on the search engine results page is being dedicated to local results. So for terms that people are looking for geographical information, you know, carpet installer in Rockaway, New Jersey, that will produce this chunk of basically Google Maps listings higher often than the number one search result, which gets pushed down here. So since so much space on the Google search results page is given to that local pack, we call it the local pack, that it's really important to focus on that now. And the, what you do with that is go to plus.google.com slash dashboard and claim, if you haven't already, claim your maps listing. This, it gets a little confusing. Your maps listing has now actually been auto-upgraded 
to a Google Plus local business page. It's a social media profile now, basically, or maps listing. It's weird, but it is. So you want to go there, claim it, fill it out, put your pictures up just like you would on a Facebook page, and you know, treat it like a social network. Get activity going on it, share your articles on it, and one of the most impactful things you can do on it is to get reviews. Reviews are one of the most powerful ranking factors on how high in that pack you come up. I'm going to take a breath while she asks the question. <laughs> <laughs> what if you're just an internet retailer? What if you're not local? How do you, how do you generate the same amount? Okay, so the question was, what if you're just an internet-based business nationwide, you don't have to worry about local traffic? Then you don't have to worry about this as much. You still want to focus on Google Plus for sharing your articles and whatnot to get those plus ones and your authorship and all those other benefits. But if it really, does, if no one will ever type in your business followed by a city name or a county name or something like that, then you don't have to worry about this particular piece. There's, to recap, the three aspects of an SEO strategy to pay attention to are technical, on page, and off page. Technical being the code type things, making sure your website is SEO friendly. On page being what keywords you use, where and how you use them, how you organize the information, and add a strategy for adding fresh content to your website on a regular basis. And off page, which is building, oh, there we go. Off page, which is building up the reputation of your site in thing, activities that happen off of your website. And measurement and improvement, so important. Like I said, it's overwhelming, right? Did I, I, did I meet my promise to overwhelm you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> It's a lot to pay attention to. But if you measure the results of your efforts all the time, you can turn up the dial on things that are working and turn it down on things that are not. For example, if you're spending equal amounts of time promoting your business on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, but all of your social signals, all those shares that are happening on your articles when you share them there, if, if 75 or 80% of that is coming from LinkedIn, well, why are you spending equal amounts of time on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter? 75 to 80% of your time should be focused on LinkedIn. And then you can save yourself some time and get better results out of the time you're spending. So that's what I mean by measurement and improvement. And stay on top of the local trends. If you walk away with nothing else today, make it Google+. Just sign up for Google+, start using it, get active, promote your business, your articles, yourself on Google+. It, it, they will reward you for using their little red-headed stepchild of a social media network. And that's it, really. So my only call to action today is, uh, actually, I put the wrong one up there, but you're free to do that as well. <laughs> I have a, an SEO report card similar to the WooRank thing that I talked about, but much more in-depth, and I created it myself and scored it appropriately according to how important I think each factor is. And so it's a 45-factor report card. If you're interested in having that done, for your site at a super discounted price, you can just let me know. The call to action I meant to put up there was to sign up for my newsletter if you want to know when I'm doing other free events, seminars, or webinars like this. But you can just either give me your business card and tell me to put, that, put you on the list, or you can go to my website and there's a box to sign up for that. So <laughs> that's it. I'm going to turn it over to Kathy now. I'm going to just, I'm not nearly as dynamic as Pam, so I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, I'm going to talk just a little bit about your domain name, I mean, about your website and things that can uh, impact your website. So, one of the things that's really important is everyone has a domain name. And what I find a lot is as we're supporting our clients, is that they don't realize that there's a whole thing behind it called a registration and a registrar, and basically what they are is they are the entity that keeps track of all the domain names out there in the world and makes sure that they're unique. And so what we did is we printed out the information for as many of you as we could before you came. That was the piece of paper you were handed on the way in. And what you should do is, well, here's, so I'm gonna tell you what happens, is a lot of times, um, especially back in the wild, wild west of the internet, people didn't pay attention to this information. And what would happen is a website developer would register the domain name, not in the company's name, but in their name. And then as things changed over time, the web developer would disappear, and then the domain name would come up for renewal. And the, the email was going to the developer, not to the company that owned the name. And they would lose their domain name. So we have a hotel that we work with down in the Red Bank area, and this is what happened to them. How many people know the Molly Pitcher Inn down in Red Bank? Their domain name was registered in their web designer's name and it expired and they could not get it back. 
Somebody else gobbled it up, wanted thousands of dollars to get that domain name back. And so what ended up happening is they ended up having to get a whole new domain name and start over, branding the whole thing. Now this was about 10 years ago. Um, things have changed a bit, but I printed this out for everybody and we tried to highlight the things that are very important for you to pay attention to. So if you look at the, um, the screen, so what I did was there's the, the, register, the, the domain name itself. This is key, the expiration date. When does your domain name expire? I don't know if Pam mentioned it, but the longer you have it out in terms of expiration, that gives you a tiny bit of link juice in SEO. You're essentially voting for yourself saying, I plan to be in business for 10 years from now, and I'm registering my domain name for 10 years. So check the, check the registration, the expiration date. Make sure that it's out there. If it's this year, renew it now. Don't wait, get it done. Um, the other one that we find a lot is the registrar's name and the, the, registrant, the registrant's name and the registrant company. In this case, uh, D. Burge is somebody that works for IT Radix. That's who I put up there. And obviously, it's in our company name. I cannot tell you how many times we stumble across this with clients. And you can check yours here on the piece of paper later um, to make sure it's registered to your company and it's an individual that still works there. Because a lot of times what will happen is, is they will have it registered to an email address that nobody's checking anymore. So then what happens is you get that renewal coming through to you, hey, it's time to renew your domain name. Nobody's checking that email, so of course nobody renews it. Now you lost your domain name. When you lose your domain name, you don't only lose your website, you also lose your email. So it's really, really important. Um, and then the, the other thing is there's a different levels. There's the registrant, and that's the owner of the domain name. Then there's admin and technical and other things like that. And what you'll find, it is not uncommon to have somebody else designated as the admin or as the technical contact. That's okay. The one that you really want to pay attention to is the registrant. Okay, so some other things. Um, what we find a lot is that some of our clients actually want to host their own site in-house. And our, our feeling from an IT standpoint is abstinence is the best policy. Don't do it, okay? You really should host your, um, your website out on a third-party web, a web, a serious web hosting company that is going to give you the performance that you need. And also the other reason why is you don't want all that web traffic of people visiting your website clogging up your internet access for your internal users. So, and the other thing from a security standpoint is it keeps all of those people that are trying to get into your site, whether they're good or bad, out of your internal network and out there on the web hosting providers. Um, what we find, statistically, 30,000 websites are infected every day. And they don't even know it. 30,000 infected with malware. I can show you this, I can give you this site. It was in Forbes. And what happens is, is you may not even realize it, but somebody has put malicious code in your site, and now you, the innocent visitor, come visit it, and you get this virus, and now you've infected your computer just by visiting the site. Um, and it's a lot, of, it's not just bad, you know, it used to be associated with porn and you know, some of those gambling sites and things like that, it's all sites. It is not just those types of sites anymore. Um, not all hosting providers are created equal. So that one, basically, you know, pay attention to what kind of um, services they offer, uh, what, is it, what are their uh, response times and things like that. If you're not sure, feel free to talk to us or any of your web designers out there. They can, you know, hook you up with reputable hosting providers. The other one um, that's important is a lot of people will use those free templated sites. You know, you go to Google, uh, GoDaddy, or places like that, and they have the free templated sites. And what a lot of people don't understand is when you move from GoDaddy to somebody else, you can't always take that site with you. You know, the content, the templates, everything they gave you was from them. So you need to you know, think ahead when you're doing that. Something like WordPress, there is a way to get WordPress out of one, one hosting provider and move it to another. But make sure if you're thinking of making a change that you plan that out and take it, uh, plan in advance. And then the last one is backup. A lot of people assume automatically that their, backup, uh, their website is backed up by the hosting provider. Whose responsibility is it to back up your website? Can anyone tell me? It's yours. <laughs> it's your website. They expect you to back it up. Um, they do give you tools. Usually when you log into their control panel, there are tools in there to help you do that. 
but you need to go in there proactively and use them. So if you're updating your site every week, like Pam is suggesting on blogging, you should be backing up your website every single week so that you don't potentially lose that content. Now, most providers are going to be able to get it back for you, but it's not guaranteed. You have to read the fine print, so something to watch out for. Last one that I like to talk about a little bit is a lot of people think that if they go with their website, let's just say with GoDaddy, that they must host their email with GoDaddy. That is not the case. You can host your website here, your email over here. You could have your, um, you might want to put your blog somewhere else, you may not. Client portals, if you have any kind of portal for your clients to log into, it doesn't necessarily have to be at the exact same place as your website. And the reasons why you might want to put it all together is it can be more cost effective. But that might limit you as to what you can possibly do with it. So don't think you're limited to just what your web hosting provider offers you. You ask questions and see if you can segregate those things out. And that's it. So <laughs> I thought what we would do now is I might give this back to Pam because I suspect you're going to have more questions for Pam than for me. But I wanted to first again thank you for everyone for coming. And we'll do some Q&A now. So if you didn't hear him, the question was, how, to, how do you keyword optimize a video? Which is a great question, because 62% of the time, YouTube video results find themselves in regular Google search results. So you know, how do you make the most of that? The transcript is one way. The YouTube offers actually an auto transcript, where it tries to figure out what the text of your video was and robotically inserts it in the background. You want to go in there and fix that because it's guaranteed not to be right. So you want to go in there and you know make sure the transcript is correct. Um, the tagging they offer the ability to tag the videos with phrases. So based upon keyword research, go in and fill out the YouTube tags um, and the titling. The titling is most you know like I said for a blog article, one of the most impactful places to use a key phrase is in the title. Same thing in a video. So definitely you know researched key phrases in the title of the video. And one of the most impactful things now is schema markup. It's a fancy term for more of those code tags that you can put behind the scenes on things on your website. So if you embed the video on a page on your site that you've also optimized for that phrase, and you tag the schema tags behind the scenes of the video, that's going to be really impactful, too, for tying all the dots together. And then actually the content promotion thing that I was talking about, the paying for eyeballs, has a similar effect on the videos. You can do. YouTube advertising to get more hits on your video, and then the more views that it has, the more popular it's viewed, and the higher it'll rank, and it does this snowball kind of a thing. Does that help? Very helpful. Okay. okay, so the question was, um, you know, what if you hate to write, basically, but you're okay with doing something like making a video, like making a demonstration video or something? How can you use that in your <laughs> SEO strategy? Um, like I just said, you can do all those things to the video itself in YouTube, but you can also use that to achieve your fresh content goals on your website by basically video blogging. A video blog is you know, an article that's posted, basically just consists of a video and hopefully a paragraph description, <laughs> at least a paragraph. The, whole, the full transcript would be great if you can get someone to type it up for you. There's automatic transcripting softwares, but they often don't work very well. So if you can get someone to type up the transcript of the video for you and have the transcript be the article with the video embedded in it, carefully keyword the title on the video and the article, and if you can't even pepper in that phrase throughout the transcript, if you know in advance what your phrase is, and say it a couple times naturally in the video, and that appears in the transcript, then that can be achieving your, your blogging goals. Sure. Yeah, good question. So he did the thing that I said not to do, and he created a blog on Blogger, which lands itself on blogspot.com. And the question was, is there a way to move that to your own website? And the answer is yes. You can. They actually offer a service where you can get the proper 301 redirects. You do have to pay for it, but it's not that much, I don't think. Um, you, you, a 301 redirect is like a change of address form <laughs> for the search engines. That this content used to live here, and now it lives over here. That's really important because if you got any links to your blog articles over time, those would become broken if you didn't do the 301 redirect. So you could just export the articles and import them into your own website, but you would have to do the redirecting thing manually then, and if you're not a web programmer, that would be difficult. So you can do the service that they offer to redirect the content somewhere else. Is there a way to uh, 
use client contact, regular client contact, and tie that into the content? What do you mean by regular so a client? newsletter or something of that type? So you mean like a content that you're already doing? I mean, and you besides just posting it as an article, is there a way to take that interaction of people opening it and clicking into that newsletter? Ah, okay. All right, I think I get what you're getting at. Um, tying in your e-newsletter efforts to your website SEO content efforts, how do you do that? Basically, uh, what I think the best, way, best thing to do is to do your regular old blogging routine, hopefully weekly, hopefully throughout the course of a month you've written three or four blog articles and posted them on your website. If your e-newsletter is just a roundup of those articles, with you know just a link to the article, maybe a little excerpt or paragraph summary of the article, that will help your SEO efforts by instead of putting the full text of an article in an email newsletter and sending that out to everyone and they can just read it without clicking on anything, if you put an excerpt and a link to the article and the article lives on your website, that's how you can get you know more activity going on the article, hopefully more people linking to it, sharing it, commenting on it, you want to have those share buttons, you know, uh, social share buttons on the article and whatnot. But that's how you can tie those two efforts together and actually saves yourself some time because you don't have to write a custom article for the e-newsletter every month. You can just round up the ones that you already did on the website. Yeah. The Google local thing that I was referring to with the dashboard where you can claim your maps listing, which is now a Google Plus local business page social profile. She said, what if you're in an office building with people and someone has already claimed your listing. That's difficult. Um, but, I mean, it happens all the time. Multiple businesses exist in one building. So Google allows separate listings for each. So it's okay to have, you know, 21 Main Street have ABC Company and XYZ Company both at 21 Main Street. So you, if someone has gone and claimed your listing that says ABC, com your company name, then, okay, that's not what you're saying. Okay, it's just the address thing. So that's fine then. Yeah, yeah, it's fine to have multiple listings at one address. They know that multiple businesses exist at one address. So if someone else has a listing at that address already and, and you, you're not found there, you can create one. So most people already have one. Along the way, it got imported into Google Maps from the Yellow Pages or something. But if you're not listed, you can just create one. Okay, so the question is, does it help to keep old articles on the site? Since the focus is fresh, new content being added all the time, what do you do with the old content? Absolutely leave it there. That could become an asset for you. If you hit the nail on the head, like I was talking about with that Facebook marketing plan strategy article, I get consistent traffic on that. It's like two years old, almost two years old. And I get traffic on it from Google all the time. So if you really hit the nail on the head and Google has decided that you are the best you know, that page on your site is the best resource for that topic, then, you know, don't go changing it or removing it or anything. Just let it keep working for you. And if it's a good topic, maybe you write another new article with a little bit different spin on it, a little bit different keyword on it, but keep going with that theme, but definitely keep the old content. That's, that's an asset. Okay, so the question was, does Google track inbound traffic from email, re referring to the email newsletter question before. From what we know, and Google doesn't, you know, give out its secret sauce and everything, but you know, from, from what uh, people in the industry have been able to figure out, um, it doesn't so much matter where you get your traffic from. What matters is that you get a lot of traffic on content and that people stay on it. Time on page is important. So whether they came from your email newsletter or they came from LinkedIn or Facebook or Google itself or wherever, the important thing is that people are staying on that content and reading it. If they're bouncing off or also called pogo sticking, they get on the article and they just leave right away, that's bad for SEO. A lot of time on page is good for SEO. And actually, your email newsletter is probably your most engaged audience. They're your clients, they're your contacts, your prospects. So they're probably the audience that is most likely to spend a lot of time on your content. So another reason to use that, to, that strategy to promote your content. So I'm pretty active if you look me up on Google. We spent a lot of time talking about that, but there are other. So if you looked me up, if you were in your Yahoo, or Bing or any of those, I'm nowhere to be found. Is that a completely different strategy for those search engines? So you're talking of like, you invented the wheel on Google, mm. but now you're reinventing it for Yahoo and Bing and Ask and all of those? Because we're assuming everybody in the room uses Google, mm -hmm. but on Yahoo, I'm nothing. Right, so. right, right. Okay, great question. So the question was, what about the other search engines? So, you know, we talked all about Google because Google has, you know, 70% market share for, for search. 
Um, you know, but there's a good chunk of people that use those other ones, the Bing and the Yahoo and Ask and whatnot. Um, you know, is it the same? Because she's saying she gets found on Google but doesn't come up on those other ones. So obviously it's not the exact same strategy. It's not the exact same algorithms. A lot of the theories carry over. I mean, in general, the search engines all want the same thing. They want great content, you know, that meets people's needs when they're searching. So as an overall strategy, it all kind of you know, comes together. But yeah, there, there might be little nuances that Bing wants to see differently from Yahoo, from Google. I don't tend to, with most small businesses, I don't tend to focus on that as much because you know, it's just as much work to focus on all those other ones as it is to focus on the monster. So why not just focus on the monster that usually provides plenty of traffic for okay. people. Okay, the question was, what's my feeling on the Google pay-per-click program? That's a great question, too. So that's the AdWords program where you can pay to get listed across the top and down the side of the Google search results. It is a beautiful thing if you can get traffic and clicks to your website without having to pay for each click, because on those you have to pay for each click. But, like I showed, that's a long-term strategy. That's not gonna happen overnight. That may not happen for 12 to 16 months, depending upon how early you are in your SEO efforts. So the pay-per-click absolutely has its place as a holdover strategy. I don't like to rely on it as a long-term strategy. Like I said, why pay for clicks forever when you could get to a point where you're getting them for free? But it definitely has its role in that first stage when you're not r rocking and rolling on the free clicks yet. It, it absolutely, it's immediate. I mean, it's expensive because you have to pay for each and every click, but it is immediate. So it can even help, you know, sometimes it's suggested as a strategy to help fund the organic SEO strategy. Because if you can get immediate returns, new clients, new projects immediately, from immediately getting on the front page of Google, that profit can help fund the longer term strategy that's not gonna help you right away.